Education of the May 25th meeting of the Penfield Board of Education. Please rise and the clerk will join lead us in the pledge. TV up here isn't on. I didn't know if uh, for the PowerPoint. Thank you. Okay, it is recommended that the board approve the May 25th, 2021 agenda as submitted. May have a motion and a second that the agenda of May 25th, 2021 is approved as submitted. So moved. Second. second. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries. All right, we are going to enter into a public hearing of the district emergency response plan. This hearing is opened at 633. And I will. Sure. So we have, yeah, we have a public hearing this evening. So if we can have uh, Mr. George English and Mr. Brandon Fox come on down um, for the board and the community. You have met Mr. Fox before. He is our um, security and preparedness manager for the district. And uh, Mr. English, you probably have seen on your nightly news when the PR went out that he is our new director of facilities for the Penfield Central School District. So George, Brandon, thank you very much for being here. Uh, I believe you have a clicker and some PowerPoint slides, and so I'll turn it over to you. Okay, good evening, board members, Dr. Putnam, Dr. Driffle, Ms. Gregory, student representatives, nice to have you here too. Um, I, it is my honor tonight to get to present to you the uh, district-wide emergency response plan that's been approved by our health and safety committee. So our district-wide emergency response plan that, that I'm presenting is for the next fiscal year, so it'll be for 21-22 fiscal year. The district-wide emergency response plan is required by New York State Commissioner's Regulation 155.17. It's also required by the Safe Schools Against Violence and Education Law. Uh, we do share it annually with our New York State Police Partners, uh, the Sheriff's Office and the Brighton Police as well. Uh, and then we are required to provide it to New York State uh, Education Department. And then uh, as required by education law, we have to just define a chief emergency officer for the district. And our chief emergency officer is appropriate. He's our CEO, Dr. Putnam. Um, additionally, the district-wide emergency re response plan is posted on our website. And because it is posted on the website, it's more general in nature compared to our building level emergency response plans, which have much more detail. And I am not going through the slides, I apologize. Thank you for being patient with me. Okay, so uh, our district emergency response plan does cover uh, all types of hazards uh, in the plan. Uh, it establishes guidelines for setting up an incident command system and communications plan in the event of a significant emergency. Uh, obviously, the goal is mitigation and prevention. And uh, the plan does cover some strategies and initiatives for that. Uh, preparedness is key uh, to success in any emergency. Uh, we do practice evacuation drills, eight of them a year, and lockdown drills, uh, four of those a year. Um, we, our plan covers multi-hazard responses and incorporates uh, relocation and reunification if necessary. Um, this year we did add a continuity of operations for communicable disease, which is new to the, the, for this year. Uh, some of the multi-hazard responses include situational responses, 
uh, as, weather, as well as weather emergencies, facility-related emergencies, medical emergencies, and transportation emergencies. Uh, crime scene uh, protection uh, will, in most cases, be the responsibility and be handled by our emergency responders. Uh, recovery is also covered in our plan, and that uh, involves reviewing and debriefing after action reporting, district support of the building, mental health uh, services if needed, and post-incident response. We do have a couple of changes for this year. Come on. There we go. Oh, I went past the first one. So the first change is in section, section 6.4, uh, district operations during a pandemic, which I had already mentioned. We did add that. That was updated and outlines essential and non-essential workers for continued operations in the event of a pandemic. And then section 6.5, please cooperate. Uh, it is uh, transportation related emergencies and we updated that from school bus accident updated to school bus emergencies uh, to include health related emergencies on a bus um, and then we also updated that after hours, if any student reports any type of injury or illness, whether it's accident related or not, EMS will be notified when a school nurse is not available. And then the following day, the director of transportation will notify a school nurse that EMS was contacted. Um, our annual requirement as a district for the district-wide emergency response plan is it must be reviewed by the district health and safety committee with a re recommendation to proceed with a public hearing as part of the board of education meeting which we are doing this evening the public hearing must take place on a yearly basis and allow for a 30-day comment period and then after the 30 days the board will uh, be able to adopt the plan and the plan needs to be adopted prior to september 1st So that's all that I had. Um, and so at all this right. point, it's open. Thank you. Public comment. If you want to say anything before we go open to, to public comment, Tom? Oh, uh, no. I, well, you ask if I want to say something, you know the answer is going to be yes. <clears throat> so I just want to thank George again and uh, Brandon mm -hmm. for the work on this. Uh, you get to come and present. Um, a couple times a year in a, in a pretty short presentation, but it doesn't at all do justice for the uh, hundreds and hundreds of hours and work in each of the buildings and each with the principals and our teams in each building. And I know, George, um, you sort of stepped into this, but thank you very much and look forward to uh, having you put your spin on it too as we move forward for years to come. So thank you. All right, thank, thank you. you. So now the hearing is open to public comment pertaining to the emergency, the district wide emergency response plan. In addition, residents who wish to comment on the plan may email or call the district clerk, Sharon Erkfitz at serkfitz at penfield.edu, and that email is on our webpage, or call at 585-249-5702 by June 24th, 2021. So now, this is, this is open for public comment, consistent with our uh, public comment period, we'll, we'll keep it up to five minutes. We still have our normal visitor speaking time, so would anyone like to speak for a maximum of five minutes on specifically on the district-wide emergency response plan? Okay, seeing none, then I call this hearing closed at 640, and now we will resume the regular business, and we will go to special reports. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a number of special reports this evening. Um, we'll start with the Mosaics Club. So the Mosaics Club is a student club from the high school and they're here with their advisor, Mr. Garbarino. If you want to come down, um, that would be great. Don't know who's presenting. If there's not, I think I got four. So I think we've got four chairs, wonderful. Um, and uh, as you're getting ready, I'll just uh, let the board and community know we do have 
Uh, several other special reports this evening. Um, we have Lisa Latin from um, BOCES. She's our board representative on the BOCES Board of Education. We do have textbook presentations and then a brief reopening update uh, for me and then we'll go into the uh, regular meeting as well. All right, so Mosaics, you have a clicker. If you could start, I don't know if it's part of your presentation, but introducing yourself in your grade level, that would be great. And then you should have a clicker to click through your PowerPoint presentation, which is on the screen. Oh. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Hello, my name is Adam Can, and I'm a junior here at Penfield High School. Hello, my name is Maria Huber, and I'm a junior at PHS. I'm Alyssa Hervey, and I'm also a junior here at PHS. My name is Nora Can, and I'm a sophomore here at PHS. Before we get into the information part of our presentation, we'd like to talk about um, the Mosaics Club vision. The purpose of the Penfield High School Mosaics Club is to promote awareness and of and appreciation for racial diversity within Penfield High School. We work to create opportunities for education and comfortable discussion between um, staff and students about racial diversities. We engage faculty and students in the ongoing challenge of making our school welcoming to all races and backgrounds. And we really work to inspire students and staff to appreciate each person for who they are and who they can be. Uh, we'd like to begin by acknowledging the district's work. Um, one of the P Penfield Central School District's core beliefs that we really appreciate is learning happens best in a safe environment which respects the individual, values diversity, and encourages effort. Regarding diversity and equity work in the district, we've, we appreciate that Penfield has established equity teams in each building and trained staff in equitable practices, changed the previous name of the Penfield mascot to a more sensitive name, and evaluated practices in curriculum to eliminate single stories or perspectives. We want to applaud the district's work on these initiatives and we would like to partner with Penfield to work to make the district a more inclusive and equitable community. While Penfield has made improvements to its inclusivity, there is still a great deal of work to be done. So I'm going to introduce some of the requests that we have today. So we would first like to uh, ask the board to consider recognizing November as Indigenous Peoples Month and also to change the recognition of Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. Second, we'd also like to continue to revise our curriculum to benefit student learning with accurate and inclusive teaching practices about Indigenous people. And finally, to change the name of Indian Landing Elementary School to a more appropriate name. Um, in preparation for these initiatives, we met with Gabrielle Papa, who is a member of the Seneca Nation at Ganondagan. She is an educational resource who provides training to educators about the history of Indigenous people in the community, and she is directly involved in the training of every teacher hired in Canandaigua. Um, from her, we learned the history of Indigenous people in the area, and we learned how Penfield factors into that history. We also connected with Indian Landing staff, and we attended a training with Michael Galban, together with Indian Landing's leadership team, to learn more about the history of Indigenous people in Penfield. Um, so our first request for the board is that they recognize November as um, Indigenous Peoples Month. Our training has gave a, um, given us the opportunity to learn more about the history of the land that Penfield resides on and the history of the people from whom the land was stolen. So many of the practices at Penfield don't acknowledge currently the history of Penfield from the perspective of Indigenous people. We're currently celebrating the culture of the colonizer uh, by using incorrect terminology and by celebrating Columbus Day. Some of the terminology that we still he hear around the classrooms and in the hallways could be Native American or Indian, which are both inaccurate representations of these people. Similarly, we also still see chiefs related athletic wear and that could be uh, uh, harmful for indigenous population. Uh, finally, uh, we still see a single story of colonization in our classrooms. This ties into our second request, which is to continue to reevaluate re our curriculum in the district. In the current curriculum, the history of indigenous people are only taught in the context of white settlers, whether that is helping or at war with white people. Unfortunately, inaccurate terminology such as Indian is still used and um, this is, once again, harmful. 
Uh, to quickly shift gears, I'd like to talk about a brief history of Penfield. The Seneca population uh, was very involved in trade throughout the uh, Northeast in the 1700s, especially. But over time, white settlers began taking over their land. A treaty was signed in uh, 1794 to guarantee the land to these uh, Seneca Nation. Uh, but by that time, it was too late, and the white settler settlers had already taken over that land, which is now Penfield. This introduces our third request, which is to change Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. Indigenous people across America are still struggling today uh, from the trauma inflicted on them by their colonizers, and our current practices at Penfield may cause pain to the indigenous populations in our school. Most people have learned about Christopher Columbus, whether that was in elementary school all the way to even college. And we've always learned that he accidentally discovered America and just came across it on accident. In our opinion, as a club, we don't think that this person should be celebrated. Once discovering America by accident and being helped by the indigenous population, he took over their land and murdered the population. Instead of celebrating him, we should be celebrating the indi indigenous people and their uh, accomplishments throughout history. Doing so and making further changes to our policy to be accurate and respectful to the indigenous culture will create a more inclusive community in Penfield. By not introducing these changes, we are failing to provide a safe environment for all students at Penfield like Penfield Central School District desires. Our third request is that the board consider changing the name of Indian Landing Elementary School. The term Indian, when used to reference indigenous people, refers to a time when land was encroached upon and taken. It is an outdated, inaccurate, and offensive term. Changing the name to a more appropriate name would be a good start to creating a more inclusive community. It is difficult to create an inclusive community if our schools embody outdated thinking and terminology. We have partnered with Indian Landing's leadership team, and we attended a training with Indian Landing leadership. At this training, we learned the history behind the naming of the school. The term Indian Landing refers to a time when the land currently occupied by Indian Landing Elementary School was used for trade by indigenous people. This history should be celebrated, but the name is outdated and should be changed. We know that Indian Landing leadership has also been considering this change, and we have them supporting us today. Just to reinstate our requests, our first request is that the board recognizes November as, as Indigenous Peoples Month and changes the recognition of Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. Our second request is that we continue revising our curriculum to benefit student learning with, in, with accurate and inclusive teaching practices about indigenous people. And third, to change the name of Indian Landing Elementary School to a more appropriate name. Thank you so much for listening to us so respectfully. Um, we have brought um, our club t-shirts with us. We designed them, I designed them a year ago and we were unable to deliver them to you until now because of COVID. But if anyone would like one, you can pick one up from our club supervisors once the meeting is over. Are there any questions? All right, thank you. Board members, any questions? Lisa? I don't have any questions, but I want to share it first of all. Mm -hmm. um, but really thank you for coming. It's been a really long year without a lot of student involvement here because of COVID. And I just really appreciate your coming. I appreciate all that you're saying um, and uh, just all the hard work that you put into presenting tonight. So thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. And I, I agree. I think it's great to have you come in with a well thought out plan and you've done the background. You've, you've presented the reasoning behind it and and actually educated us a little bit as well. So, and you have a plan and moving forward. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Can I, before you leave, can I, can you tell us uh, who your advisors are from Mosaic's Club? Um, Jennifer Pavone and Jordan Garbarino. I apologize because I mentioned Mr. Garbarino, but I didn't mention Mrs. Pavone, but I think she's hiding back there. So I do, I do see her as well. Um, and so I just wanted to say thank you. The Mosaics Club is, is really one of the clubs we have at the high school that was completely student created. Mm -hmm. So before, it was nice to hear that you're juniors and sophomores because I believe the club um, predates you at the high school. So I'm looking at Mr. Garbarino and getting a nod for that. So that really was a, a student club that came from 
uh, the Rock to Change event, which is taking place tomorrow, a little differently than we have in the past with, with COVID. But the Rock to Change event has been um, happening for quite some time, twice a year. And that's when schools, uh, high schools across Monroe County get together with students. And it's all student-led, student-created, and the focus really is around equity and diversity and, and how we have difficult conversations, which you are examples of tonight that students have a much easier time with these difficult conversations sometimes than adults do. And so I just want to say thank you for, I know how much work you put into this presentation. I also want to acknowledge that you referenced, we do have uh, Indian Landing um, staff and, and parents here. Could Indian Landing folks raise your hand if you're here? I see lots of your red shirts, but just so the board is aware, the number of pe people from Indian Landing coming out. And, and this is work that's, that's really important. I will tell you is that uh, in terms of a name change, it's something that the board will definitely look at. We'll be talking with Indian Landing, but that's going to take time because um, I was a history teacher in West Aronicrate right when the, they changed from the Indians to the Eagles. And I know that here in Penfield, when there was a shift from the Chiefs to the Patriots, there was maybe, and I can say this because I was just a teacher then, so I wasn't in a leadership position, but it really wants to make sure that you bring lots of stakeholders in to have conversations, to educate where you guys are now in terms of why I can't answer. And I know Marcy Ware is here, the principal of Indian Landing, and one of the first questions she had when she started was, why is it that name? And, and you guys already know that. So I really appreciate that. I think it's an opportunity to continue to look at what we can do in this district to make sure that every single student feels safe and supported. And so one of the things I did as I was thinking about this meeting, so is that New York State, and I encourage you to go there too with the Mosaics group, and your advisors probably know, is they came out with relatively recently and then, and then solidified it, the culturally responsive sustaining education framework. And this is from New York State. Everything that we do in, school, in the school system is around the New York State standards. And this really sets New York in a, in a place to say, we really need to look at affirming people's beliefs, affirming and creating welcoming environments for all students. And when we think about diversity, it's not just indigenous people, it's not just uh, families of color, it's all students, students with disabilities, students that come to us with trauma. All of these different areas is really how do we support everybody to feel safe. Knowing that students like you are attending the high school and are working with advisors like Ms. Pavone and Mr. Garbarino, is, these are the opportunities I as a superintendent and as a parent and as a citizen say to myself, our future looks really bright. You come here, you speak so eloquently, you put together a plan like the board member said, and we really, really do appreciate that. I appreciate that um, uh, very, very much. So thank you so much for coming. Um, and, and this will not be the last time uh, you and I meet and hopefully that you continue to present to the board. So thank you. And then just, this, that was like a huge round of applause for you. So oh. thanks. <laughs> <laughs> nice job, guys. Nice really job. Nice. I know you mentioned t-shirts, but this meeting might go a little long. So like Ms. Pavone and Mr. Garbarino, I know where you are. We can find you. So please don't feel like you need to stay to the end. So I see her dropping off t-shirts. If you give them to Ms. Zirkvitz, Ms. Bradstreet, thank you so much. Thank you. It's another day. I don't need to do laundry. <laughs> um, we are moving forward with our night of special reports, and we have um, Lisa Latin, who is our uh, connection to the Monroe One BOCES as our uh, board representative. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Hi. All right, so tonight we're going to do a little change of topic. I'm going to be presenting about one of the programs that we have at the BOCE Center in Fairport. And tonight's presentation is going to deal with the multi -AC programs. And let me just, okay. So I wanted to start off with current enrollment because obviously being a component district with BOCES 1, some of the kids that are referenced by these numbers are our students in Penfield. So EMCC, which I will talk about at another board meeting and I'll present what their programs are specifically, um, current enrollment looks amazing there at 610, and these were enrollment numbers at the end of March. Um, the EMCC adult program is nine, and the multi -AC focus, which is abbreviated MOF, has 112 students, 
and those students attend from other districts. And not just BOCES 1, some of those students come from BOCES 2 as well. And so the special education program students that are in the multi act focus are 21 and they come from other programs at BOCES. So this is just a brief overview. So if you have any questions, hopefully I can answer them for you. So the multi act program, which I was not aware of a parent, as a parent until my child was actually in the middle school when we were looking at um, what his high school program would look like. And so this is a pre-career or pre-vocational program, primarily but not limited to high school students with special needs. And the students can choose among several programs and are encouraged to explore at least two programs of study. The small animal care and handling is located off-site at um, Lollipop Farm. And the multi act programs are offered only in the morning sessions, and those are two credits. There's two 80 minute blocks depending on the student's schedule at their home high school. So they'll either go for session one or session two. And that's really formulated with the team at the child's high school depending on how their schedule is set up. So what is the multi act focus? Um, these programs are really committed to offering high school students opportunity to develop those pre-vocational skills that are so important. And especially when you're talking about students with disabilities and that they might be eligible for schooling through age 21 that we really need to be talking about those pre-vocational skills earlier rather than later. And it's providing real life learning combined with job skill development. I seriously can't figure out this thing. Yeah. These are the programs within the multi act focus when I mentioned that before that um, students are encouraged to try two different programs throughout their time there. So there's 21st century tech skills, the automotive trade where kids are actually working on an actual vehicle. It's not just simulated learning. The buildings and grounds, again, kids are learning how to use and operate all of this machinery, um, obviously with supervision, <laughs> but um, <laughs> that is really popular with the students. Consumer and family sciences, the food preparation program, which is amazing. It's um, a professional grade kitchen. The small animal care, like I said, is located off site. And then the social media marketing and project management is a program that I've just recently learned about. And it's not working. We got Dr. Driffle trying Okay, to I got it. All right, yeah, yeah. Okay, Froze so up. this, You're good. <laughs> this <laughs> video is produced by students. And it's eight minutes, and I'm actually not going to play it because I noticed that you have quite a large number of people in the audience, so I don't want to make your meeting longer. But this video was produced, and it features the students in all of those classes that I just discussed, and the social media team of students produced it. Mm. Oh, so nice. it's, if you have eight minutes, listen to that because it's really amazing i can just second that i watched it a little <laughs> bit earlier it's good. really good so I, I i agree i appreciate your um yeah. understanding of the meeting and but i think the board will absolutely watch it it's amazing right up it's yes. the kids are amazing it's really it's it's wonderful and it's also if members in the audience wanted to see it as well mm -hmm. that are listening at home or here this video is also on the BOCES 1 website. If you go down under programs, it, there's a hyperlink that you can play from the multi act focus program. So I would encourage you to do that and see what the students are learning. And that's it for tonight. So does the board have any questions about what I talked about? Board members, Catherine? Catherine? Hi, how are you tonight? Good. So I'm curious about the small animal care program at, Lolli at Lollipop okay. Farm. Um, is that it's not level of tech, right? It, like Say, a, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. It's not like a level of uh, uh, tech, like a vet veterinary tech. Kind no, of thing, but it, it's, it's not. They're just learning, I believe, like the management of the animals, caring for them. 
you know, taking them out of their cages, cleaning the cages, um, working with the staff there in terms of just basic care. It's, I don't believe it's veterinary care. Yeah. It seems like it might be an entry level mm -hmm. shadowing kind of thing. Yes. With some hands on. Mm -hmm. right. And they COVID impacted oh. their ability to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So um, the plan is for that next year, I believe, to be operational like it was in the past. I think it's lollipop was closed for most of the year. So actually, yeah, that's that's made true. it a little difficult to operate the program. <laughs> well, I appreciate that um, that you know these different programs that are being offered. That's quite mm -hmm. a wide range for a lot of different interests. It is, and I was hopeful the board could see that. So when those things come across your email for approval, you would have a better understanding yeah. about what some of those programs are at the BOCI Center. Great. Thank you. And so I'll try to choose one each month or every other month that I come and talk about the different aspects of those programs so and, you have a better understanding. Um, not every board member has because COVID slowed our, our response this year, but we have in the past toured, brought the board over to tour uh, um, oh, Monroe One great. BOCES. Yeah. And so now that you're there too, you know, we'll make sure that you're part of that. Sure. Um, but typically Dan White, some representatives mm -hmm. bring us around. Um, the board members who were able to attend remember their, their culinary kitchen. They actually uh, run, run that throughout the day. So yeah. in a non-COVID world, staff can actually come down and order food. And, and they're and, still running that. And so the students are preparing the food that they're selling and the students like operate that completely independently, the yeah. cash register, um, labeling everything, preparing everything. And so it's intended to be, you know, on the job training. Yeah. Yep. So it's really great stuff to see. Wonderful. That's great. Barb? Um, Lisa, thank you so much because uh, you know where my heart, um, my heart is when it comes to BOCES. Yeah. Um, and I just find it just refreshing that you are coming here to share with um, not only the board of Penfield, but with everybody else in Penfield that what the wonderful um, partnership is great. Um, with BOCES and, um, and all the, the other things yeah. with the other school districts, the 10 component districts. Mm -hmm. But um, just the fact that these kids are getting this wonderful, amazing um, experience mm -hmm. and what it, it can do for their life and um, moving forward. So thank you, I appreciate yes, it. You're welcome. And just piggybacking off of that, we had a board meeting last week and a student from their cosmetology program oh. mm -hmm. came and presented and she now has her own salon in Victor. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. And she now takes students from the current cosmetology program and they are interns oh, wow. at her um, salon. So mm -hmm. just seeing that progression of right. what she learned at 15 and 16 mm -hmm. years old and how that's turned into a career for her. And she's mm -hmm. very successful. So, that's yes. Amazing. Wonderful. Right. Other board members? So I had a, a question. Yes. How long has this program been going on? I do not know the answer to that question. A long time. <laughs> I think long time. You, you kind of alluded that <laughs> at, uh, it wasn't in place when I think you said your child was in school, correct? No, my child is actually in this program. Oh, in this so program. So this okay. was easy so for so me to talk about. Okay. I think she said she was, you weren't aware of the program. I, oh, I was not aware yes. of the program That's until right. he was in middle right. school at Bay Trail. Yeah. And I think but like I think a lot a of parents, right. um, we really don't know all the great things that BOCES has to offer. Mm -hmm. So I'm hopeful in this role to be able to present that to the board so the board has a better understanding too and the community, of course. Well, thank you. And this, you know, we talk about college and career ready, and this is a, a, you know, a big part of the of being college and career really ready. Really valuable programs. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Lisa. Thanks, yeah. Lisa. Other questions? No. Okay. I'll think of so a few more. So just make sure you watch that video. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah we, have the, we have the link on our presentation. <laughs> you can send me the quiz. I took it. <laughs> <laughs> There's going to be a satisfaction survey at the end that you yeah. need to answer the questions about. Nah, it's really, it's really nice. And this is a reminder, especially like EMCC and Multiac as well. This is where BOCES uh, and and for the 
for the community, the board's aware, this is where BOCES is truly a, a, a it is a, it's a fiscally responsive op opportunity mm -hmm. to run these programs in-house mm -hmm. for the very few kids we have who might be interested or, or set would cost us uh, a, quite a lot in regards to staffing, equipment, um, but, but utilizing BOCES, being able to send students from all over um, BOCES uh, one area and beyond, um, the, the cost savings is, is huge. So I think that's really where they come into play. Um, the one, just as an example, is sort of like the auto tech. Uh, you know, many years ago, every high school had right. its own auto mm -hmm. uh, center. We had one here yeah. where our computer tech rooms are. You know, we had the lift and we brought cars in. And as the technology changed in cars, we couldn't keep up anymore. Mm -hmm. And the amount of money we were spending for a handful of kids who were interested, it didn't make fiscal responsibility. And the mm -hmm. district was ahead of that and shifted away. And our BOCES program around autom automotive care of cars increased a bit. But my gosh, if you were on that tour or seen it, it really is a state-of-the-art facility and students aren't just, you know, they're working on the new cars with the diagnostics and the electric uh, systems and it's really, it's really amazing. So um, again, that's where that partnership with BOCES is, is critically important. Thanks, Lisa. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So moving on through our evening of special reports, <laughs> we have some incredible textbook recommendations. I'll invite uh, Kristen Williamson um, up. And who else is coming? I've got Taylor Ramsey and Shane Watterson uh, who will be starting us off with our presentation. And these books we're looking at for next year. And so you'll see typically we're able to uh, bring books in smaller groups to the board. We sort of are at a point where uh, we do need to um, really try to get them approved this year so we can use this year's funding for textbooks to purchase them for next year. It takes a while to order when you're ordering books for schools. It's not like the two-day shipping for Amazon Prime. Uh -huh. um, but again, I just, I'll let them present, but a lot of work went into this and I uh, appreciate your time this evening. Yeah, thanks for having us. Um, so before we get into the books, we did want to let you in on the process that we took to choose these um, textbook selections. So we do have a K-5 Humanities Committee, which is comprised of several teachers um, in all of those grade bands. Um, and they've been working on this for the last year and a half, so kudos to them. Um, and our goals were really about integrated text and then diversifying our selection. Um, there we go. Uh, so that first goal, when we think about um, integration, it's really the idea of how do we create a comprehensive experience for our students so that our text can be used for multiple purposes. So we're not having an ELA block and then we're going to science and then we're going to social studies, but we can really integrate and give that cohesive experience to our students. Um, and we, we did a lot of research around this and why that's so important. And it really has to do with building background knowledge and expanding student vocabulary. And we know that those two um, uh, facets of reading have the greatest impact on comprehension. And so uh, again, the committee did a ton of research um, around that. In addition, we wanted to make sure that we're diversifying our offerings for students. So we did look through the uh, lens of equity um, and also we used the diversity checklist. Um, but we really grounded our work in an article, um, Windows, Mirrors, and Sliding Glass Doors, with the idea that the books that our students um, come into contact with should be mirrors, okay. um, so affirming their identities. They should be windows into um, experiences and perspectives wow. that maybe they don't have access to. Yeah. And if they're really good, they could be a sliding glass door in which the students yeah. really experience yeah. um, something from someone else's perspective. So with that being said, we're gonna share just a couple highlights because as Dr. Putnam mentioned, there's just a few books on our list. <laughs> um, so one of the first grade books that we're looking at is called <clears throat> Nana Akua Goes to School. It really helps our first graders examine families and develop an awareness of cultural diversity. Um, specifically in this book, Zura and her classmates are really excited to bring their grandparents to school for Grandparents' Day. Throughout the book, we meet many special grandparents, such as Aleja's abuelo, who's a fisherman, and Bisu's Mimi, who is a dentist. And Zura's a little worried um, to introduce her Nana, who is her favorite person in the world. Nana Okua looks a little different than the other grandmas, as she was raised in Ghana and has tribal markings on her face. 
uh, following an old West African tradition. When Zura shares her worries, Nana Akua uses a quilt of traditional African symbols and face paint to explain what makes her special. Through this story that is a window for many of our students, first graders love to talk about the vocabulary terms diverse and culture as they compare and contrast with their very own families. And a third grade book that we um, have actually loved this year is called The Proudest Blue. And it's a story that allows our third graders to explore cultural diversity through religious differences and the social impact that that brings at all ages. The story centers around Faiza, who is very excited for her first day of school. Her older sister, Asaya, is starting sixth grade and wearing a hijab for the first time. Faiza just loves her, new, her sister's new hijab and that it's the color of the ocean. Our students learn about taking pride in their customs and their traditions as Asaya shows strength in the face of school bullies. Our third graders really connected well to the story and came back to it often throughout the year as a window into the life of a family who's Muslim and what that means for them in America. Hi, um, I'm Shane Watterson, and I just wanted to let you know my role in the STEAM TOSA. So I'm really focused on implementation of the new science standards right now. Um, and so this is like a super powered team here where we've got the director of humanities here. Taylor's a, a current third grade teacher. I'm coming in with a science perspective um, and really pulling together all these strands and hopefully making our curriculum more cohesive for students. Um, so I just want to briefly share our second um, integrated unit for fourth grade um, is entitled, How Does Where You Live Impact How You Live? And this is where we're really going to take that lens of how the, the science of our Earth's history and the erosion and deposition that's happened here in New York State has caused all these wonderful landforms and bodies of water that we have here. Mm -hmm. So we'll study that science at the same time, also the geography and the social studies that goes along with that. And then also how those resources have impacted where indigenous people settled and lived and how they use those resources because of the natural processes that created the landforms in the first place. So one of the books that we're recommending here is Forces of Nature. In this text, you actually have two different pieces. One is the legend of Paul Bunyan and all of the um, you know, sort of silly reasons that perhaps landforms were created, including the Great Lakes um, and you know, our, our own Great Lake. And then it's paired with Water's Might, which is a nonfiction reading that goes through the history of our region and the actual glaciers that dug the trenches and then melted to eventually fill those lakes that we have. So it gives the, the kids an opportunity to go a little deeper with the ELA combined with the science and social studies. And in fifth grade, one of the books that we are recommending is Encounter, and this would be used in their second unit, which is about um, exploration. And so the idea that countries throughout history have explored territories that are often already inhabited. And so what are the effects on the people that are already living there? So this story is told through the perspective of a young boy um, who lives in San Salvador when Christopher Columbus lands. And it's told through his lens of warning his people that these strangers seem here seem to have come here for gold and not friendship. Um, and so the, the entire story follows his narrative, which as um, you know, Mosaic's kind of indi indicated tonight, that's an important perspective to include in our, in our work. Um, so all in all, thank you for, for listening patiently. Thank you to Shane um, and Taylor, and certainly thank you to our Humanities Committee. Not only did they do the research for a year and a half, they did the paperwork, which is a lot for a lot of books, and they are currently working on lesson plans for the books that we hope to get approval for. So we do not intend to just hand these to teachers and say go off and, and combine them with your curriculum, but they'll have an additional layer of not only those curriculum units, but an actual lesson plan to go with, with the books. Um, so thank you to that team. Great, thank you. Can um, we do, and then you've got uh, middle school and high school too, right? But can we do questions for for these? I'm sorry to jump in, but maybe do questions that the board has for the K-5 books, and then and then and then questions for the secondary books. I feel like that's up to you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Do you want me to make the call? No, no, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Uh, all right, board members, any questions for the K through five books? All right, good.
Can I ask a question? Of course. So we're on this time in my house with a three-year-old where we're getting back to our roots and watching shows that I grew up with. We're on the third season of ALF right now. This doesn't reference ALF, but it does reference the other one we're on, which is Reading Rainbow. And I think that Shane and Taylor, you, if this doesn't work out for you, you could both find a spot on Reading Rainbow because how you presented those books made me, uh, a middle-aged man, go like, oh yeah, I gotta get into that book. So I'm so glad that you're in our classrooms. Shane, as a, as a TOSA this year, still in our classroom, supporting the work and supporting teacher. And, and Taylor, thank you for everything you guys are putting forth. And obviously Kristen, um, for all the work around this. Just the thoughtful piece around how these books are selected. And it's not in a vacuum and it's not made from one office, but truly, a, like I said, a year and a half in the making as we build and look at, at these texts. And I do have a new appreciation or a renewed appreciation for kindergarten and first grade books because of having a little guy at home and getting a read again. And that, I can't get over, I love that concept you talked about, which we've talked about in a district a lot, around mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. And the last thing I ever wanna do now is read a book about a superintendent. I know it, I'm done. I need, I need the windows and the sliding glass doors. And I think if we all think of those books that really brought us to a powerful spot, it's about something beyond what we know. So I, I love that and can't wait to read all of these with, with my little one, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so now we've got secondary. How does it, come on up. <laughs> Sorry. So I've got Lisa, uh, Lisa Henry uh, is gonna talk about high school. And I'm, I'm, I need the middle school name. Katie Barley. Katie, thank you so much. So I'll let you guys introduce yourself, let the board and the community know what you teach, and then um, we'll turn it over to you for our, our secondary books, which I'm very excited about. Hi, good evening and thank you for having me. My name is Katie Varley and I teach seventh grade English language arts at Bay Trail. Um, the books I'm going to share with you tonight um, are all by the author named Jason Reynolds. Um, he truly is, in my opinion and many other people's opinions, one of the great young adult writers of this generation. Um, these books are for an author's craft unit that our seventh graders will participate in during the months of February and March and they are going to examine how Reynolds' choice as a writer influenced the message he wants to convey to the reader. The first book is called Ghost. Um, running, that's all Ghost has ever known, but Ghost has been running for the wrong reasons. It all started with running away from his father, who, when Ghost was a little boy, chased him and his mother on the streets. Since then, Ghost has been the one causing problems and running away from them until he meets Coach, an ex-Olympic medalist who sees something in Ghost, crazy natural talent. If Ghost can stay on track, literally and figuratively, he could be the best sprinter in the city. Can Ghost harness his raw talent for speed, or will his past finally catch up with him? The second one, which I think is going to be an extremely popular one, um, is called Spider-Man, Miles Morales. And this novel tells the story of Miles Morales, who must balance his po uh, powers and responsibility as Spider-Man with his schoolwork, friends, and family. Lately, his spidey senses have been off. He's not sure if it's from the per pressures of his scholarship spot at the prestigious Brooklyn Visions Academy, his relationship troubles with friends, or from something more sinister. What he does know is that his senses go haywire in his history class amid his teacher's lectures that seem to target the minority students in, school, in the class. Miles must come to a decision. Is he going to fulfill his responsibility of being Spider-Man and defend what he knows is right? Or is his time as a superhero coming to a close? The third book is called Look Both Ways, and it's a tale told in 10 blocks. Jason Reynolds captures the simplest nuances of our lives in this book. The plot of Look Both Ways seems simple. It captures one day's walk home from school, but within that structure, Reynolds conjures 10 tales, one per block, about what happens after the dismissal bell rings, and weaves them into a funny, poignant look at the detours we face on the walk home and in life. Through this format, Reynolds captures a range of experiences, highlighting what binds us as well as what makes us and our lives unique. This down-to-earth story captures what it is to be a child. I have two more, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, as Brave As You is the fourth book. Um, Jeannie's summer is full of surprises. The first is he and his big brother Ernie are leaving Brooklyn for the very first time to spend the summer with their grandparents all the way in Virginia in the country. 
The second surprise is when the boys find out that their grandfather is blind. Thunderstuck, Jeannie peppers his grandfather with questions about how he hides it so well. Jason Reynolds explores multi-generational ideas about family love and bravery in the story of two brothers, their blind grandfather, and a dangerous rite of passage. The boys learn of a secret room and the reason their grandfather wants them to learn how to shoot a gun. Long Way Down is the fifth and final book. 15-year-old um, Will is leaving his apartment with a gun shoved in the back of his waistband of his pants. His brother Sean was murdered and Will understands the rules of his community all too well. No crying and always get revenge. Will is heading out to avenge his brother's death. He gets on the elevator at the seventh floor and is excited. He knows who he is after, or does he? As the elevator stops on every floor, Will is visited by ghosts from his past, Buck, the guy who gave Sean the gun before Will got it, a girl he went to school with as a child, and even his own brother. Eventually, someone gets on this elevator and tells Will a powerful part of the story that Will is completely unaware of, and this makes him question his revenge plan. So those are the five books that we're looking for our book club unit. This is where we just sit here in silence. No, that was, thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Thank you for your time. You. If Reading Rainbow did middle school books, <laughs> also. Oh, thank you. Good evening, my name is Lisa Henry and I am the chair of the English department at PHS. We would like to ask for your approval on three different texts. And I think you're brilliant, talented, courageous, beautiful. You're my miracle but you're the only one who can say who you are with authority. So who are you? This question is the main focus of Angie Thomas' novel on the come up. Set in the same neighborhood as her previous novel, The Hate You Give, the main character, Bree, struggles to find out who she is. She wants to find her voice as a student, a daughter, and a rapper. This high interest readable book includes themes about being in the working class, finding your dreams, finding your identity, and persevering through hard times. Students will also be able to relate to contemporary issues such as the role of the artist and the power of social media. One of Bree's songs goes viral and she faces backlash about her lyrics. We'd like to include this in our 10th grade curriculum as part of our continuing efforts to offer diverse perspectives. The next book Everything Sad is Untrue by Daniel Nayeri is an autobiographical novel told from the perspective of a young Iranian refugee. After his mother converts to Christianity and flees from a fatwa in Iran, a certain death sentence, Daniel, his sister, and his mother end up as refugees in Oklahoma. Daniel uses stories, often referring to a thousand and one Arabian nights, to explain his former life and culture to his sixth grade classmates. Beautifully written, this book is funny, sad, poignant, but uplifting. It's about a young man coming to terms with what it means to be an American, but still holding on to his culture and heritage. We plan to use this in the 10th grade memoir unit, which co coordinates with the 10th grade social studies curriculum learning about different cultures and places in the world. Something that is loved is never lost. Beloved by Toni Morrison is a Pulitzer Prize winning novel. We would like this approved for the AP literature curriculum. And in fact, the college board lists Beloved as an example of a book that AP and honors level students should be reading. Set in Ohio in 1873, Sethi a former slave, lives with her daughter. Her family struggles believing their house to be haunted by the ghost of one of Sethi's children. The story tells about Sethi's life in the present as well as flashbacks from her past. Beloved deals with relationships and families, especially the bonds between mothers and daughters, the effects of trauma, especially slavery, and the power of love. This is a higher level book that students, in fact, anyone who reads it, will always remember for its powerful writing and themes. I could go on, but I, <laughs> <laughs> I have more, just in case anyone's interested, but I can stop there for questions. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you. Board members, any questions on these books? 
Abby. Oh, is it on? Yep, you're on. Okay. Um, I have a comment, and I would like to say that as a current high school student, I feel that the idea of these books being added to the curriculum is extremely, um, it's extremely, I, I'm really happy about this idea because as you had mentioned, it does offer diverse perspectives, and I do feel that that's really important. So thank you for coming here today. You're welcome, and I'd be happy to loan any of these to you to read at any point. H24, come on up. <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Abby. Any, any other questions or comments? because <laughs> I also have a secondary book. Um, so I'm also here to represent the seventh grade science team this evening. Um, and I'm excited to present a new science research for seventh grade. So it's been a, a lot of ELA. I'm kind of switching gears here, but it is secondary. Um, so this is really exciting. We've done so much work to get to this point of adopting a new resource for seventh grade. So I hope you'll, you'll take a look at it and really consider it. Um, all new science standards in December of 2016. And then our steering committee met and we decided to move at Bay Trail from a domain specific model of science at the middle school to an integrated model. And in the summer of 2018, our seventh grade team spent a great deal of time reading storylines that took biology and chemistry and physics and earth science and wove the story together. And they have been looking at resources for a few years now um, and even engaged in some failed pilots where the science resource actually segments <coughs> the different branches of science. And so they've landed on the science dimensions text and did a pilot this spring. And it's so exciting because it truly does weave together the stories. It starts out with all things are made of atoms, living or non-living. And then they go deeper into the chemical reactions the matter transitions, energy transitions, both in living systems like photosynthesis, cellular respiration, growing up into ecosystems, and in earth systems. So they're also learning about how the rock cycle has physical and chemical changes and transfer of energy and matter. And so all of these pieces really truly get integrated in this resource. Um, and so this is the one the, the seventh grade team is hoping to um, adopt and start using next school year. Um, it comes as a digital first program. So it is electronic with student interaction through simulations. They partnered with Google to do Google expeditions that are embedded um, and students can journal and interact with the text electronically. Um, they're also interested in getting a class set of print copies of the text so that they can balance the screen time with um, physical interaction with the text. Um, and so if you have any questions, I could go on and on about the <laughs> phenomena that launch each of these stories. I'd be happy to meet with anyone individually who wants <laughs> more I'm, depth. I'm, I'm taking you off reading Rainbow. We're going to put you on Bill Nye. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Thank you. So any questions, I'm happy to answer. Um, but the Science Dimensions is our, our seventh grade recommendation. Thank you. Did I see your hand? Oh, no. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I, I do have a question. I, we, we've talked about, and you've talked about, how much work goes into selecting this, and especially since it's not just picking a book, it's integrating it into the curriculum. And, and yeah, I wish I had thought about this with Taylor, Shane, and Kristen as well, but how do you go from the, the spectrum of books to limiting it to finding the books that really fit best? One of the biggest things that I do, I know, is um, I ask my students what they're reading. Um, and I mean, our job is to promote the love of reading. So when they tell us something that they're really into, I always, or if multiple kids are reading it, I always take that into account and make sure that I look into it. Um, the books that I have here, actually, I had some kids pilot for me um, and I got really good reviews. I mean, I love them, but just because I love them doesn't mean that the kids are gonna love them. Um, and that's, that's really kind of how I start out the journey from there. I'll just add a little bit. At the high school, I belong to many, many lists and email servers that talk about prize-winning and high-level young adult and um, literature. 
and often we'll order one or two books from those lists and then at the high school several of us will read those over the summer especially when we can fit them in and in fact everything true is everything untrue is sad um, mr baxter came in my room we'd ordered two copies just to try it out off a list and he said this is this is beautiful this is amazing. You have to read it. So by now, almost all of us in the English department have read it. We meet as grade level teams. We think about where holes are in our curriculum, especially through the years we've been trying to build up our diversity and different perspectives, um, getting some books by women, people of color, different cultures. So all of those go into effect. And of course, if the kids will read it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Good. Well, thank you. Thank you, because I know a lot of work goes into it, and yeah. you come down to this very narrow, you know, you select a specific set of books. I, I would just share, um, first of all, Jason Reynolds is, is amazing. So as a young adult author, he, he really is just fantastic. Um, and so I'm glad. I know our students in middle school are reading him anyway, and so being able to grab those books, and I love... Um, K-12 is we really have done, thanks to incredible teachers presenting tonight and, and our directors and TOSA, is, is not getting stagnant in what we do offer. You know, so, so there's always classics. They're there. They're still on the read list. They're used. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we're also continuing to move forward to say, what else is there? What are the new classics? What are kids going to read? And looking at um, all of the work that our students have to do in terms of ELA assessments and AP exams and being able to uh, reach deep into their toolbox of, of literature they've read to make comparisons, and um, it's just powerful. And so I, I think it's great. I. You know, I, I told you a story once long ago about a book my mother sent me to read, and we read together, and, and the other one is Beloved. So Toni Morrison is, is loved in my household, um, and, and that book, I was one of those ones that it pops up on, on the approval list, and I'm like, how is this not approved already? Didn't we approve this? So it's really, it is a powerful book. I agree, it's, it's an AP book in terms of, um, um, terms of that, that, that context, I think, which is important, but it is, it is beautiful. So I'm, I'm glad to see that one on there personally. So. Okay. All right, board members, any other any questions? One last chance. Great, well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so last special report, and I promise this, this one will go like quickly, is, um, uh, is me. So just a, a special <laughs> report on reopening. Um, as a reminder, uh, we're in, a, we're in a, a good place, K-8. So April 19th, we uh, were able to use cohorts based on the New York State Department of Health guidance that we're still in a red zone and that if you use cohorts, you can bring kids back. So April 19th, we were able to bring our K-5 students back uh, successfully. Um, obviously, the virtual program uh, still exists. We did have students in virtual come back uh, once they were back in person five days a week. And then just, it's just kudos to students, staff, parents and guardians, um, really have been wonderful and supportive, understanding, um, especially around traffic. Uh, I'm really, really hopeful that next year everybody will ride a bus mm -hmm. and we can get back to somewhat normal. Uh, and I say that as a parent who drops off kids every morning. Uh, May 18th, uh, we were able to, we said we wouldn't give up and um, middle school uh, does not have a cohorting ability as easy as elementary school classrooms. But on May 18th, we were able to use grade levels as a, co a cohort. So uh, we were able to really think outside the box. Kudos to the school board uh, giving me the leeway to run with that and uh, supporting our, our never-ending journey to get kids back uh, in school five days a week. And so we are able to use cohorts at the grade levels to bring students back. Uh, it's been a full week. We're into the second week now. And honestly, um, due to schedules, uh, return required teachers to teach a class synchronously. So that means our virtual students are being taught at the same time in many cases as our in-person. And teachers have really had to flex their, their uh, lifelong learning concept and really think outside the box. Um, and I just, again, uh, students, staff, parents, and guardians have been wonderful, supportive. I, I, it's difficult to try to shift to a synchronous learning model. Um, teachers are, are utilizing a number of different technological means to make that happen. 
and uh, I was able to get in last week, walk through some classrooms, some really cool stuff happening in the synchronous world. Um, but I, I'm honest and upfront that it is not, you know, it's not, uh, it's not college level synchronous learning. Uh, teachers are learning it and students are learning it at the same time, but it, that was the only way due to the schedule that we could get middle school back. And I just thank you to our staff who've really been over backwards to, to um, be able to do that for us and our students and parents as well. Um, you know, I, I wear a couple hats and one of them is, is dad to two middle school kids and they are very happy to just be back in school um, and even the synchronous is, is, is going okay for them. They are getting to see some of their virtual friends mm -hmm. on screen, mm -hmm. so that's been helpful. Uh, PHS, unfortunately, this is a, a struggle, but I, I have to throw in the towel here. Um, we have been unable to use cohorts at the high school simply because of our schedule. Um, our classes, our study halls, our lunches are all scheduled with m students from multiple grade levels. Mm -hmm. So at middle school, all the sixth graders eat lunch, all the seventh graders eat lunch, all the eighth graders eat lunch separately. They're never together. At the high school, we have two cafeterias. We have a cafeteria and a commons. And so they are ninth and 10th grade and 11th and 12th grade. Our study halls are, uh, for the most part, multi-grade level, and many of our classes are multi-grade level. Um, you know, you do have, uh, we just said English here, and they, they obviously you've got English 11, you've got uh, English 10, but as you get into low classes, science classes, math classes, uh, technology, and almost every elective, there are students from multiple grade levels, so we can't simply say it's going to be a grade level cohort. So with less than five weeks left at the high school because of Regents exams, the, the few that are being offered, we uh, determined that, that we're going to remain hybrid virtual for the remainder of the school year. Um, but the focus remains on celebrating our students, especially our seniors preparing to graduate. So we've had, we've hosted a prom, we've hosted a senior ball, seniors had a senior bash. To drive out, take a look at the huge sign in front of the high school about uh, congratulating our seniors. Uh, we are looking forward to graduation itself with a, um, a quite a day made for our students uh, at Frontier Field to celebrate in gra uh, graduation with our seniors to try to give them a great send off for a very roller coaster unique year. Um, so that's, that's where we are right now. Um, mass and distance, want to give an update. I had a meeting today with Monroe County. Uh, we continue to work with New York State Department of Health. We are still required to use mass for K-12 schools. Uh, we don't see this changing before the end of the school year, but we're monitoring <coughs> guidance for September. So frustration level is for me and probably for all of us is an all time high. Uh, with you know the, the they came out saying that uh, daycares would need to mask um, and now they said masks are um, encouraged uh, at daycare but not required and so but in school um, although all around us is opening up in restaurants I went to go see a movie in a real movie theater um, this is all lovely but at the end of the day our our schools are exempt from that new guidance um, and so k-12 is still under the mask mandate um, with warmer weather we're going to continue to find ways to get kids outside um, the distance remains three feet when cohorts can be used and that's the rule in our elementary schools and Bay Trail Middle School six feet for eating lunch so really looking at September and um, we're reopening advisory committees have been meeting we will continue to meet to create full re reopening plans for September they are using the current guidance which would really require cohorting because what we don't want to do is come to September and for some reason uh, be back in a red zone and have to cohort so we will be planning for cohorts which uh, we now have learned we can do K-8 um, but in high school what would a cohorting system look like and then New York State and the Department of Health have made positive statements just over the last 48 hours about relaxed guidance for schools and will continue to advocate for more local control and flexibility. We are seeing that start to break. Um, you know, my frustration, I know the board's frustration is, is the governor is a great politician by saying things uh, for a great press release and a sound bite, but then we need to see the actual change in guidance. And so 
we're hearing that something is going to be coming. Um, Kathy Grotman is the president of the Monroe County uh, Superintendent Group this year. She was on the media, and we're all pushing pretty hard that words are wonderful, but we need to see guidance right. on paper so we can start planning now. Don't wait until July and tell us what September needs to look like. The sooner we get that, the better. However, we are... Um, I think it's kudos again to this board in, in our district. We are the only school in Monroe County that's cohorting middle school by grade. Uh, we're one of four that were able to get middle school back. Um, and so I, I, I commend the board and, and our school administrators and teachers for continuing to push on that and think creatively. So we'll be doing the same thing for September. I have said publicly, I can't do this again as a superintendent, as an educator, as a parent, as a leader. Um, we will find a way to get all of our students back and we're gonna continue pushing on um, uh, clear guidance from the state. So we are committed to that full return based on the current guidance, but hope that updated guidance does not require cohorts. 100% um, virtual option is not yet required by New York State. So we do have a committee looking at the virtual option, uh, but also been honest and open that that's not a requirement yet by New York State. And if it's not a requirement, it will be a conversation uh, based on how many students are asking for virtual and why they would need it. Um, so uh, we're continuing to push for September. <clears throat> uh, the last thing I have is uh, we do have an email that went out um, last week uh, about a um, we're doing a vaccination clinic we're just hosting it here at the high school for families who are interested and that's the Pfizer vaccine for uh, uh, ages 12 and up so you need to have a parent with you um, but there is a, a form to fill out we have a hundred spots we're using just so the community knows we're using WorkFit, which is the same um, organization we use for flu vac vaccinations that we've done in the past where we open it up to staff and then we have a day we open it up to all the whole community and so there's no there's no cost for the district there's no there's no financial transaction it's something they do as part of their organization they bring nurses in and they take care of it uh, for us so, so it's a good partnership we've had for years for the flu vaccination and now they're offering the COVID vaccination we didn't go with any sort of um, uh, other partnership we went with one that we've known and and that's worked well and then again it's we're just sharing that information it's up to families if they are interested um, and and I, I last I knew as of this morning there were still spots left um, so if people are interested it probably will fill up quick but those vaccinations will be Thursday and then I can't remember the date but it's however many days later that there'll be another one for those people to get their second uh, second dose and that's it for my my update all right, thank you, Tom. Welcome. Board members, any questions for Tom's update? Mm -hmm. All right. All right. <clears throat> so believe it or not, that ends special reports. <laughs> mm -hmm. Excuse me. Okay, which brings us to the approval of the consent report. And so pretty hefty one here. It is recommended that the board approve the following consent agenda. The approval of the minutes from May 4th the, that is submitted, the acceptance from the committees on special education, preschool special education, the acceptance of the recommendations on the superintendent of personnel changes, the request to approve the recommended bidder, and I can't remember, Tikogen for service and maintenance of the cogent unit, the acceptance of the recommended bidder, Brownstein, Delis, and Bakeries for um, bagels. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the request to approve the recommended bidder for the Music and Arts Center, String Instruments, and Salantio Music Products, and Music West for Music Instruments, and this is a Monroe to Bosey's bid. Request to approve the recommended bidder for Hershey's Ice Cream, that's a Monroe to Bosey's. Request to approve the recommended bidder for Upstate Niagara Cooperative for milk and juice, and that's a Monroe to Bosey's bid. The request to approve the recommended bidder for Kim's Coffee, Coca-Cola Refreshments, and Allen's Associates, and Monroe to bid. The request to approve the recommended bidder of Palmer Food Services, and the request to approve the recommended bidder of Mid-State Bakery distri Distributors, again, for bread supply. So with all of that, May have a motion and a second that the Board of Education approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Any questions or comments? 
All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries. Starving now. <laughs> yeah, no. Now I want some ice cream. <laughs> <clears throat> Which brings us to the student representative report. Abby, would you like to uh, present your report and introduce the guest? Yes. Um, before I get into my report, I'd like to introduce Lila Harvey, who will be the student representative after me. Um, hello, my name is Lila Harvey. I'm a sophomore this year at Penfield High School, and I'm looking forward to taking on this responsibility for the upcoming school year from Abby, who, I'm, who has done an amazing job. Um, just a few facts about me. I'm on the swim team here at PHS and involved in many clubs, so I look forward to using my experiences to be able to deliver a well-rounded report to the Board of Education regarding the student body, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, it is that time again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so to start things off, at Penfield High School, the juniors and seniors were able to take part in a socially distanced junior prom and senior ball. I was able to attend the senior ball and it was a wonderful event and my feet hurt so bad at the end of it. <laughs> but I like to think that if your feet don't hurt, you've done something wrong. There you go, that's true. Also at Penfield, many Penfield seniors attended the Senior Bash where there were games, prizes, and the opportunity to see friends from different cohorts. The Best Buddies Friendship Walk occurred in early May. And AP Biology class students walked to Linear Park to perform tests on the water there. At Bay Trail, staff and students put the Bay Trail model of taking care of others into practice as items were collected for the Penfield Ecumenical Food Shelf. At Scribner, Master Kim from Master Kim's Taekwondo Institute taught about bullying prevention to students. At Indian Landing, one third grade, grade class turned their room into a Wonka factory as they enjoyed a scavenger hunt, making slime, and chocolate ice cream bars. At Harris Hill, students had the opportunity to enjoy the sunshine as they practiced their spelling words outside with chalk. And a few classes after state testing, students participated in some calming yoga to de-stress and get ready for the rest of their day of learning. And at Cobbles, one fourth grade class of students practice outside in the recent nice weather we've been having. And before I get into district-wide news, I would really like to mention that I think it's amazing that these students are able to have these opportunities because I know that school can be a pretty stressful space for students of all ages. So having opportunities like being able to practice orchestra class outside, I feel really allows students to experience school in a relaxing and academic sense. Mm -hmm. For district-wide news, Earth Day was April 22nd and schools throughout Penfield celebrated in various ways. For example, there were bulletin boards at Scribner and students had an Earth Day walk with messages and signs at Indian Landing. May is Asian and Asian Pacific, um, May is Asian and Pacific American Heritage Month. The food service team helped to prepare and serve thousands of healthy meals for students in and outside of school this year. And May 12th was School Nurses Day. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. Board members, any questions for Abby? Huh? Catherine? Actually, I have a comment. I have really appreciated um, your occasional input and your insight, uh, bringing a student's perspective into the various uh, presentations and your opinions. I think you've done an amazing job this year and I'm sorry to see you go, happy for what's next for you and looking forward to working um, with, is it Lila? Yeah. And um, wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Other board members? Oh, and again, I think Catherine speaks for all of us and, and Lila, we welcome you and we look forward to working with you. And if you have any questions, of course, your, Dr. Putnam's always here, but uh, you know, as well, the board as well is always available if you have questions. Thank you so much. The biggest really you have to remember is you just have to do a better presentation than I do. <laughs> and Abby set, those, set that bar pretty high, but I think you'll do great. Dr. Yeah. Putnam, yours has pictures. Don't sell yourself short. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I know, I think that Abby has something that she probably needs to leave early for tonight. Was there something that you had or no? I do. I have a lacrosse game. Um, is now an okay time? I can stay. If... No, I think I think you better get out there for yeah. lacrosse. Yes. I do not want to. 
uh, you guys are doing really well this year. All right. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. It's nice meeting you, Lila. Welcome, Lila. And Lila, you're welcome to stay if you want, or you know, you're free to go as well. Oh, thank you so much. Go cheer on the cross. Yeah. All right. And don't forget, you have one more meeting left. June June eighth. Well, you're back, right? Yeah. All right. Good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right, this brings us to visitor speaking time. This is the designated time for the district residents to bring their comments to the board. The board encourages residents to share their opinions, voice their concerns, and offer suggestions in a constructive atmosphere. Matters involving particular individuals or specifics of negotiation are not permitted during public session and should be addressed privately with the board president or superintendent. Comments brought to the board will be taken under consideration. However, this is not the time when the board can answer questions or engage in dialogue. A request to speak form must be filled out prior to the start of the meeting and given to the district clerk. Speakers are expected to identify themselves with their name and address before presenting and limit their time and limit, and limit their comments to five minutes or less. The board president reserves the right to limit the amount of total amount of visitor speaking time based on the length of the agenda and written comments to the board are always encouraged. Okay. All right, so the first speaker, and I'm going to try to read this to see, it's Charles Seaman. Mr. Seaman, please state your name and address. Good evening, my name is Charles Seaman. Uh, I live at 733 North Landing Road, but many of you probably know me in my role at 702 North Landing Road, which is the K-5 music teacher at Indian Landing for the past 15 years. <laughs> I'm also the father of four beautiful daughters, all under six, one of them at kindergarten at Indian Landing. So I have many hats as well as I come to you tonight. <clears throat> I'll go as fast as I can, so stay with me. <laughs> First, I'd like to take a second to thank you for your work. It has been a crazy and difficult year, and I can't thank you enough for how uh, you have led this district. It's been very difficult, and I can't imagine how difficult it has been specifically for you guys. Uh, you had to constantly reinvent the wheel, choose between bad and worse, and while your hands are tied to doing all these things. So a big thank you is in order to you guys for everything that you have done, because I know all too often you hear a lot of complaining. But now I'm gonna move on to the complaining. <laughs> <clears throat> what I'd primarily like to highlight tonight is a specific series of decisions that have been made this past year that has impacted the music program in a detrimental way. Simply put, last May, two music teachers retired and the decision to stop the search for their replacement was made. The result of this was the amount of music time that K-5 students get was uh, cut in half across the district K-5. 50% less music for all K-5 music across the district. If you have a kindergartner like I do, that has to hurt your ears. The decision according to board records was made as a result of potential financial projections because of COVID and specifically the potential loss of county sales tax and state aid. If you've listened to these financial reports the last few months, these show higher revenue in those two lines than even projected. Coming out of a global pandemic, we are actually in a fairly financial secure position, thanks in large part to you guys, and yet, I have not heard anything about hiring for these two music positions or to reinstate the music program at the elementary schools. And that's why I'm here tonight advocating for the music program. It seems as though to me that this is a permanent move, not just a COVID time program change, a permanent 50% cut in elementary music. And that's unacceptable to me as a parent. While I could talk to you for hours about how music is one of the best ways of teaching DEI and SEL, I don't think most of you need much convincing. If you've been to a concert and you've experienced a solo being sung in front of 500 parents by a student that was too shy in third grade to stand up in front of their class, you've experienced music's SEL. If you've, visited, if you've visited the music room and seen students of color faces light up when they learn that spirituals that we are learning are the foundation of jazz and spirituals and even the bedrock of modern American music today, then you've experienced the power of music to teach DEI. I promise you can't get that depth of understanding through a scripted program. 
Recently, I've learned that Penfield is creating a new position of assistant superintendent of DEI and SEL. And while I am more than supportive of these initiatives, it was salt in the wound that Penfield could not find the funds to replace two music teachers. But we are creating a space for a new district level administrator. In short, these decisions result in September, this September, students getting less music and therefore less DEI and less SEL. Music can help you achieve your DEI and SEL goals, and so can I if you give me the tools to do so. And so I come to you offering solutions, not just concerns. I think it would go a long way if you, the board, would offer the community some commitments, clear and measurable goals before hiring this new assistant superintendent position. One of those being a fully supported and staffed music program. Another, elementary class size is no larger than, let's say, 21. My daughter is in a kindergarten class of 26, and that's a common number at Indian Landing. That's too big. It's unrealistic for any teacher to effectively teach DEI, SEL, or anything with class sizes this size. Finally, my role in the solution. Penfield's music curriculum is largely focused on music literacy, perform, uh, uh, producing some really amazing musicians, I might add. And while we spend approximately a third of our classroom music time on SEL and DEI concepts, it's mainly because music lends itself so well to do so and because that's a commitment of ourselves, not because that's Penfield's music curriculum focus. So I would be willing, therefore, to participate in a team of teachers to document and write into curriculum DEI and SEL principles that we would incorporate in our music class. I am confident that we can get our music curriculum up to at least 30% content of DEI SEL components that could be taught to every single K-5 student across the district. Lastly, I understand that sometimes we need a headline and we need some PER, or PR, not ER, <laughs> but I am content, not content with the headline that we are currently creating. So what if we change that headline? What if the headline read, Penfield leads the way in SEL and DEI by putting students first? What if it read Penfield's doubles down on music to lead the way in the whole child philosophy that Penfield has championed? These are headlines that I would be proud to help you with and the community wants to see. Right. So I thank you for your time. I thank you for your support of the music program and I'm confident together we can achieve our DEI and SEL goals. Thank you for your time. Great, right. thank you. Thank you, Mr. Seaman. Next is Eric Feltz. Mr. Feltz, please state your name and address. Good evening, uh, Dr. Putnam. Oh, sorry, Eric Feltz, Two Barry Wood Circle. Good evening, Dr. Putman, Putnam and fellow members of the board. So I came here tonight to speak about two topics. The first I will keep very brief. It was brought to my attention today that my children in Scribner we're in 90 degree heat with no mask breaks. I would very much appreciate if somebody would look into that and potentially give them at least one or two mask breaks throughout the day. Secondly, and just so everyone is very clear, yes, I am the husband of Nicole Feltz who is running for school board. So I came here to speak today to better understand diversity, equity, and inclusion. There's been a lot of talk about that throughout the course of this evening, as well as in the months running up to the election. What I'm concerned about is the harassment that my wife received during the election, to which we wrote a letter to each one of you that went unanswered and ignored. So how are you, as leaders of this community, teaching diversity, equity, and inclusion when you allow current and former PTA presidents of Penfield and Bay Trail to call my wife publicly a racist and a white privileged fool. I know there has been some dialogue back and forth earlier this evening. I also understand what the rules are for this part of the conversation. So does anybody have any remarks for me? Well, Mr. Feltz, I'm just going to say that what happens in the outside of the school district is something that we, you know, it's outside of our realm of control. We, we make sure that our district, our district members, 
and our board behave accordingly and you know the public has a responsibility for doing the same among some cells really so the p t a presidents currently do not fall within that rule or your board members who chose to escalate the situation instead of deescalate it so i would i would share in this is it, with visitor speaking time it's not a dialogue with the board i do know i'm meeting with you next week i'm guessing this is what it's about so we can have a conversation outside of a public board meeting uh, i think that would probably be the best spot for us to continue the conversation because visitor speaking time is not a dialogue back and forth with the board and, and the public thank you for your time yep. and the next speaker is brian um growly growl uh, sorry i'm sorry Okay, thank you. Okay, so please state your name and address. My name is Brian Growney, live at uh, 19 Finchwood Lane. The Penfield School District recently sent home a, a letter to fourth grade parents about equity training being conducted in our child's classroom. My wife called the administration and specifically asked if there would be any anti-police or white privilege content in the curriculum. The administration assured her that there was not and said it was just a social studies course about historical maps and redlining in Rochester. She requested a copy of the curriculum, but instead was given generic links to New York State social studies framework and a FAQ on Pastone. The FAQ contained the phrase contemporary realities of structural raci racism, which made us believe the course did not just teach about maps and redlining. After numerous phone calls and emails, we finally received a copy of the curriculum. We were shocked to find on day one, the first material shown to students was a video of various little kids saying, I feel guilty for having white privilege that I don't deserve. A little boy saying, I feel scared to walk down the street. Cops will start beating me up and doing terrible things to me. A little girl saying, my cousin went to Catholic school and she felt awkward for being the only black person there and a statement saying, New York has the most segregated schools in the country. I watched, the first, little vi I watched the, the first video with my fourth grade son, and when it got to the point about the cops doing terrible things, I paused the video, and I said to my son, the police are good. They play a very important role in our society that maintain law and order. His reply was, quote, I don't know what to believe. I think my teacher would say that police are bad, end quote. I did not watch the second video with him as I did not want him to think we were racist for going to church every Sunday. The curriculum also had incorrect definitions stating anti-racist, defined as someone who is actively fighting against racist rules and ideas. Racist, defined as someone who makes or supports racist rules, practices, and laws through their actions or inaction or expressing a racist idea. When we called the administration back to ask why they lied to us about the course, they simply stated that they had not watched the videos or seen anything else wrong with the course. I'm not an English major, but I feel it is very common knowledge that you cannot wor use the word you're defining in its definition. In this example, the course is defining the word racist and uses the word racist twice in its definition. This is particularly concerning since the administration trained at least 20 teachers before rolling out this course to students and none of them raise a concern about the definitions or videos. This leads me to believe that the school does not have a safe environment for teachers to speak out against anything in DEI courses. I suspect this is because they would be called a racist or worried, about, worried that it would affect their job. What makes this more alarming to parents is if teachers aren't in a safe environment, how do we expect that our, our students and children are in a safe environment in the classroom? Is teaching incorrect definitions, supporting anti-police messaging, and making people feel guilty based on the color of the skin aligned with Penfield's core values? It's important to also note that the school has time to reprimand parents trying to communicate to other parents what is currently going on in the classrooms. However, the school administration itself has not communicated any of this to parents or what their plans are for future DEI contact next year, specifically. I'm particularly passionate about this subject as my biracial brother is an Albany fire, fireman 
and has told me countless stories how recent police, anti-police messaging has directly impacted his safety and his ability to help others. I will always stand against any material that segregates pe people based on the color of their skin with a purpose of hatred or making them feel guilty because of it. I also stand against sweeping statements that talk negatively about our police force. This is destructive messaging meant to divide our communities and our nation. The Penfield administration has lost the trust of parents with their utter lack of transparency, allowing politics in our classroom in this topic. They fostered an environment where emotionally outspoken people can call anyone that disagrees with them racist. The current focus is on teaching our children hatred and what makes them different versus the common ground and acceptance of one another. Everyone should be judged on the content of their character and not by the color of their skin. I would like to know what the school board is going to do about this. Thank you. Thank you. And the last speaker is Rich Tyson. <coughs> and Mr. Tyson, please state your name and address. The microphone's tall enough tonight. Appreciate following the tall guy, thank you. Rich Tyson, 21 Doltop. Um, being on Doltop, I'm actually one of the few people that doesn't live as close to the school as Chuck Seaman, who was up here a few minutes ago. He's a little bit closer than I am. Um, but as an Indian Landing, Indian Landing parent, I can tell you that I've appreciated the name of the school. Part of that is it's been an educational opportunity to talk to my daughter. Why is it called Indian Landing? Well, those are the folks that came before we did. And you know what we've learned throughout those conversations, much like we've learned when we go back to her mother's native Thailand, is that the concept of conquer is not you know, unique to America. It was pretty much the standard for a couple thousand years leading up to about a few hundred years ago. Thankfully, that's pretty much stopped other than a few places. Um, something that I did hear this evening that was a little concerning is the idea that the Penfield Patriot is a potentially non-inclusive term. As someone who served this country in the United States Navy and lost a great uncle in World War II, I can tell you that the idea of patriotism is something that's uh, very near and dear to my heart, and I would hope it's the, uh, let's hope the same with uh, the Penfield School District. Um, so I want to touch on two uh, real quick definitions. Diversity is the state of being diverse. It is the practice or quality of including people from a range of different social and ethnic backgrounds and of different genders, sexual orientation, etc., and differing from one another. Inclusion is the act or state of including or of being included within a group or structure. The practice or policy of providing equal access to opportunities and resources for people f uh, who might otherwise be excluded or marginalized. So, um, it's under my, uh, my impression and from a conversation I had today, um, I unfortunately didn't have a chance to touch base with you, Dr. Putnam, uh, to follow up on our conversation from a week ago. My wife and I had attended an equity audit call, and I'll remind you, for those of you who don't know, my wife is an Asian immigrant from Thailand. Um, we participated in that several weeks ago in the hopes of uh, obtaining a position on the district supported and backed DEI commission. We felt that we had an awful lot to bring to that, both being a, a family that's half immigrant, a minority, and having a child that uh, doesn't look white. Um, and so I, as I understand it, uh, after those equity audits were conducted, that information was compiled and put into some sort of a rubric. There was a, a group of people that wasn't really disclosed to me who took that information, I guess kind of compiled that, and then a broader group of uh, administration folks within the district um, chose who was going to be on that commission. And I, I, I'll be honest, I'm not so surprised to find out that my wife and I were not chosen to be on it. And the reason I'm not surprised is I would encourage every every single one of you to go back and watch those equity audit calls and watch the disdain and the abhorrent behavior that was uh, basically pushed towards my wife in her responses. She echoed many of the same sentiments on that call that I, echo, or that I repeated and, and, and provided to you last month, that we think that everybody should be treated equal, and that we think that everybody should be treated, again, based on, like the last gentleman, on the content of their character, not the color of their skin. And the eye rolling and the disgusted look on faces of folks within that equity audit, because I was on the Zoom and I was watching the faces while she was speaking, was appalling to me. And I said to her after we hung up, you and I are never going to be on that commission, because if that's how the consensus of, the, of these folks are acting, they're going to be picking someone that doesn't want to have our thoughts. And that is the exact opposite of diversity and inclusion. So. I'm hoping that as you roll out the acknowledgement of who's going to be on that 
commission that it's very transparent and that we have a very good understanding as to how that selection process took place because I don't think we're going to see a lot of diversity. I think that what we're going to see, much like I've experienced in other diversity commissions that I've participated in this community, is that diversity and equity inclusion, the people that they want to have involved are the people that agree and that there's not a diversity of thought and it's not very inclusive of people that don't agree with the the goal or the mission of that commission. So I would encourage transparency in that process and I would welcome uh, any thoughts that you may have on the topic and I don't know how much time I have left. Uh, just under a minute. Just under a minute. Any thoughts at all? I'm assuming not. I, I'll, I'll respond just because there's some misinformation. I want to make sure. I know Please. you and I played Thank some you. phone tag. So the, the uh, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Committee, the district committee um, um, that's in the works and has been in the works for a while, had nothing to do with the equity audit. So you referenced that you were on the focus group call. Correct. And there were two different parent focus groups. Anybody who wanted to attend could. We invited people. Um, the, that had nothing to do with the selection process for the DEI committee. What we used for the DEI committee selection process was the form that got sent out to the entire community and the staff that they could fill out. So you did fill that out. I didn't see your wife. Um, I don't know if she filled out that as well. I think we put both of our names on it, but that, that may be the case. Okay. So I think it just said your name on it. But, okay. But, um, so that's what we used. So anything that was said in the focus groups uh, was not was not used for the DEI committee. Okay. We utilized a rubric based off of the New York State Cultural Responsive Sustainable Education um, and went through and really just read people's statements to try to find um, the, best, the best fit. That being said, there, it's the core team that we're working on it. And you know, because you talked to somebody today that you weren't selected for that, which is your reference. Someone at the high school. Yep. So, which is, so that'll come out. But we could only have, basically, based on the size, uh, I think it's one parent from each elementary school, two from the middle school, two from the high school. Um, then we're going to have subcommittees. And I left you a phone message just saying that we're going to invite everybody there to be on those subcommittees as well that will be meeting regularly. So anybody who's interested in that work, we'd want to be able to invite them in to be part of those conversations. But I guess, I guess the only miss, just to make sure we're on the page for the community and that's, watching. that's not exactly how it was explained to me today. No but. problem. So that's, it's really, we used that form that was created and filled out and use that and we had uh, just about 80 people who were interested so we had to narrow it down we wanted to make sure that we do have diversity on there so diversity of religion diversity of gender diversity of race um, and also diversity in having parents who are raising students with disabilities trying to really incorporate diversity all of thought that. should be a a qualifier as well. Uh, I don't know if it is for the diversity, equity, inclusion piece. I, I agree, but it's really around work to, I would say that looking at that, I can guarantee you that not everybody thinks alike. Um, there's all different, all different focuses on there. And that's why everybody who wasn't chosen, we're going to invite to to be part of our subcommittee work. Because this work is going to take a lot of time in terms of reviewing our curriculum, our textbooks, our assessments, the work we do. We want to have as many stakeholders involved. And so you've been outspoken for that, and I appreciate we'll that. Continue and we'll continue yes. to be. We'll continue to be. We'll continue to work together. That's Perfect. your stakeholder and important part of this process. Thank you. So, and, yep. and if I could leave you with one thing and then I'll get out of your way, I'd love to hear some other things being talked about outside of equi diversity, equity, and inclusion, like scholastic excellence and some other things that we send our kids to school for. We can do a pretty good job at home you know, giving them the experience of, of, of a diverse community in which we live. Uh, and some other uh, topics would be great to hear about from you folks. And I appreciate your time this evening. All right, thank you. which I guess brings us to student and staff honors. All right, so student and staff honors, I'll uh, be brief this evening. Maybe, are we frozen again? Frozen. All right, so every year we have uh, Monroe County School Boards presents an outstanding senior award, and this is one student from each of our high schools across Monroe County. And uh, this will be presented, uh, but she is aware of it. So congratulations to Penfield High School, Ya Korn, who has been named as this year's outstanding senior. Um, again, students from across the county are gonna be honored in upcoming video. It's a little unfortunate because we um, typically have a, 
uh, a dinner celebration where the stu outstanding senior and his or her parent and guardian, they invite two people, sit with the superintendent, and it's um, across all the high schools in um, in the county. And, and that really is a, a wonderful evening. Uh, we have a guest speaker in and the students are presented with their award. Um, last year, because of COVID, we couldn't do that. This year, again, we couldn't uh, plan for this. And so instead, there's a video um, that will be broadcast on uh, Fox News here in Rochester, as well as online. And we'll get details on exactly when it's going to be uh, shared. Um, but just congratulations to Yah, incredible graduating senior. Um, um, she's one of those students where, where it was a pretty easy selection uh, from the high school, who's just someone who goes above and beyond in all things and is just really a pinnacle of success here in Penfield. Um, so I'm excited to, to celebrate this with the school board and our community. And then also we had just here on this stage last week, uh, athlete signing. So congratulations to the following PHS athletes who signed their letters of intent at their spring signing ceremony. These are students heading off to continue their sport in um, uh, division one and division two uh, colleges. We, um, I'm gonna get there because I can't read those names this far away. Uh, uh, LASIK surgery only lasted a few years. So Aaron Block, uh, graduating senior, who will be running track at SUNY Binghamton. Anna Carpenter, who will be playing soccer for Thomas Jefferson University. Uh, Jonah uh, uh, Questus, who is gonna be running track at Kent State University. And uh, John Rakusa, who will be playing lacrosse at Canisius College. Kendall Scanlon, who will be playing soccer at Gannon University, and Gage Zeal, who will be playing baseball for the uh, University of Miami. All in, incredible uh, young adults off to um, play at their uh, Division I, Division uh, II colleges. We also here had in the stage just kudos to Mary Beth Walker, our interim director of athletics, who uh, um, also we celebrated the students going off to Division Three in community colleges who will continue their sports. And uh, it was a nice event. Um, take a look at Facebook and Twitter for some lovely photos of, of everybody. And that, I guess, uh, I guess that's it. So I, I don't have a question slide, but that is actually it because during special reports, I wanted to go over the reopening and where we were. Um, but again, uh, a, a great event for our students. The one I will mention, I don't have a slide for, but I do want to mention it is our strikeout cancer event. And that was last Saturday evening. Uh, it's a varsity baseball game. Uh, it's the 11th year that it was uh, ran. It's always against Fairport. It used to be called Coaches vs. Cancer, and they've shifted the name over the last few years to Strikeout Cancer. And uh, Penfield Varsity played Fairport, and we had a, a lovely event. It's the sports boosters for baseball that help organize all of it. But we had, uh, there was a fundraiser. Uh, they made, at the time of the game, uh, $2,400 that'll go off to the American Cancer Society. Um, but it was a nice uh, to take two rivals like Fairport and Penfield and put them together. So Brett Provisano, the superintendent was there, both high school principals uh, from Fairport and, and uh, Penfield, athletic directors from uh, Penfield and Fairport, and as well as town supervisors from Fa Fairport and from Penfield were all there. Um, got to, uh, superintendents got to say a couple of words and um, we all got to throw out a first pitch, which was a lot of fun. Yeah. I had my children there. I actually did pretty, pretty well. Um, I was really terrified and had nightmares of not being able to reach home, home base, but, but I, I felt proud of myself for that. Um, my kids gave me no compliments. Um, but that's it for this evening for uh, superintendent reports. All right, thank you. Which brings us to the uh, authorize the contract to ro upstate roofing. It is recommended that the superintendent be authorized to contract with upstate roofing for the PHS 2, a phase 2 roofing work as described. On May 21st, 2019, the voters approved a proposition authorizing $7,550,000 for the 2019 capital projects, roofs, track, and turf. With the additional dollars available within the authorized budget, the district can complete more required roofing work than originally hoped at the Penfield High School. The State Education Department approved the additional scope of work on April 29, 2021. On May 3, 2021, the district received a proposal 
from upstate roofing for the additional roofing, uh, which is phase two. The proposed the proposal utilizes a cooperative purchasing agreement, commonly referred to as piggybacking, through the interlocal purchasing system, and the district contract manager, I'm sorry, construction manager, campus construction management group, has compared the pricing, material and labor, and the scope provided by Upstate Roofing to the SCI Design Group's state-approved construction documents. Furthermore, in the opinion of campus CMG, the price provided by this, and it's a TIPS contract, is either at or below the amount authorized in the TIPS contract and appears to be within the current market pricing for our region. A copy of the campus construction's recommendation letter has been provided to the board for review and the approval is recommended. So may I have a motion and a second that the superintendent be authorized to contract with Upstate Roofing for the PHS phase two roofing work as described above. Authorization uh, to contract with Upstate Roofing. So moved. Second. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries. All right. It is recommended that the Board of Education approve the Penfield Health and Safety Committee Charter as submitted. Per the Commissioner's recommendations, or I'm sorry, Commissioner's regulations, it is necessary to readopt the Penfield, High, the Penfield Health and Safety Committee Charter each year. The charter was reviewed by the committee at their May 6, 2021 meeting and readopted with a minor change. The charter was given to the Board of Education prior to this meeting for review. So may I have a motion and a second that the Penfield Health Safety Committee Charter be approved as submitted. So moved. Second. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries. Policies for second review. It is, it is recommended that the Board of Education approve the following policies as presented. And that is 7230 dual credit for college students. It's recommended that the above policies be approved as presented. May I have a question or comment? I mean, may I have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Any questions or comments? Did we receive any feedback on that? We did not. All right. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries. And now, so it's now we have the Monroe, the Monroe County School Board Association's committee meetings. We have the legislative committee. Catherine, would you like to speak on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll get us started and then Mark, as always, you can fill in my blanks. I usually have quite a few of them. <laughs> um, so we had our legislative meeting, um, I, I think it was May 5th, and we talked a lot about um, and, uh, upcoming meetings with our legislators. We had, uh, it was, oh my goodness, so many of us were there from the different districts with the frustrations about reopening and, and what we've heard over and over again for months. And so we were all looking forward to the upcoming legislative um, uh, meetings with our local and federal lawmakers. And yesterday, Mark and I attended our meeting with Congressman Joe Morelli, and we were able, we talked with him for an hour. We had a long agenda. We couldn't get to everything because what we did get into, we were able to dive into a little bit more deeply. So we were able to talk to him about student loan forgiveness um, and what the president what his intentions are with that. And um, uh, Joe Morelli's thought was that, you know, well, he gave us his thoughts on that. Um, and one of the things that on the congressional level that they're talking about is um, reducing the interest rate on those loans to zero. So if they could, yeah, I mean, that's wow. what they're discussing now. So if, if those student loans could be refinanced at a 0% um, interest rate, that would make such a huge difference with so many people who are carrying around that debt. Um, so that was one thing. Kathy Groutman really talked a lot, well, we all did about the school reopening uh, frustration and how we absolutely must have 
guidance now. And we stressed with Congressman Morelli how important it is to get that information and to um, be on the same page and have consistent information. And um, we explained to him, because he feels it would be very important if we could, on the federal, state, and local level, all be on the same page with the CDC guidelines, the New York State guidelines, and then the Monroe County implementation of that. And we expressed our frustration once again about how we always have to deal with Albany and how there's that lack of consistency because, you know, we know that there was like a five-day delay between the CDC changing their guidance and then New York State deciding they were going to go along. And, uh, you know, Joe's comment was, I long ago gave up <laughs> trying to explain the governor. And <laughs> we all know that. Um, it, it is what it is. But uh, that Albany uh, directive has just been so difficult to deal with and we've had to live with it and we've had to live with the consequences of it and it was wonderful to be able to express that to our federal um, you know, representative. Not that he's got a direct ability to change that, but it's good to have that knowledge out there and have it be understood on that level. Um, Okay, let me just see here. We talked to him about the uh, school bus shortage, uh, this bus driver shortage too. And this is really very cool. Just think about this for a minute. We explained what goes on, the license that these drivers have to go ahead and do before they can uh, perform this job. And Joe didn't understand that this was a federal, uh, you know, mandate, if you will. And it was very enlightening to him, and he said, well, then I'm going to have to talk to Transportation Secretary Buttigieg about this. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Now, when you think about partnerships and, you know, that advocacy that we do with our lawmakers, this is exactly what we're talking about. Having that connection with our congressman, he's got the ear of the Transportation Secretary on the federal level. And that doesn't, that doesn't happen just like that. That happened. Sherry Johnson has done so much to keep these relationships built up and engaged with the districts, with our lawmakers, and the participation on the district level. There's, there were many people on that call yesterday. And, um, you know, these, these uh, meetings are very important and very productive. So I felt really great about I thought that was a profound statement because you don't, you just don't hear that, you know, and, and that wouldn't be possible without our advocacy. So I wanted to say that. That's what I had, Mark, um, that I thought were important points to cover. And then I have a lot of other notes, but maybe you wanted to. No, I, well, I, I think you covered, you know, really the, the, the key things. And, you know, one thing that's important is that we, we are fortunate that uh, you know, Representative Morelli does give us his time, and, and he it's and it's more than just a cursory. I'm here. He does engage with us. Um, he, the other thing that, he, he absolutely does, and he had his staffers there. Yep. And he told us what staffer was going to pick up, what point that uh, he was going to be looking into. Yeah. He it really is quite an interactive partnership. Right. He recapped the points and the actions, his actions at yeah. the end of the meeting. And it's fortunate for us that he's also on the House Committee for Education and Labor. So yeah. he, he not only just as a, as a congressman, he's also on the committee that is directly relevant to us. Exactly. Um, and, and, and you know the bus the bus thing we've talked about, and we, and we mentioned this with him in the past. Although I can, it just takes reinforcement because so many things going on. But I did also mention that I think we're the, we we actually had a day that was really a transportation day where we had to. You know, not have school because we didn't have buses, and he was really shocked to hear that yeah. that that actually caused yep. us not to bring kids in. So uh, I think that's the kind of information that he can take back, mm -hmm. and and it drives the importance of that. Even though it's not exciting and 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 you know it's not in the news all the time, it's something we live with day to day. Exactly, that's that's exactly right. And I did want to point out while I have the microphone, <laughs> is that. Um, you know, Tom, you, you brought up the student and staff honors. And 
it's it's just unfortunate our visitors had to leave when they did because we weren't talking about DEI, you know, and we weren't talking about budgets. We were talking about our students yep. and their accomplishments. So just have to say that as well. Thanks. Okay, any questions or comments on that from the rest of the board? Let me get back to here. And then there's the district committee meeting, which was the health and safety meeting. Uh, Emily or Bill? The charter. The charter. Yeah. I'm sure. So we, so we need to we have another uh, charter for another year. <laughs> yeah. And finally, the let's see, I'd say finally, finally, the vote results. The following uh, are the vote results from the May 18th, 2021 budget vote and election as certified by the inspectors of the election. Uh, proposal one, which is the 2021 2022 budget passed, and that was. 230, uh, 20, 2,308 votes to 722. The land purchase passed, and that was 2,126 yes and 882 no. The bus purchase passed, which was 2,939, I'm sorry, 2,394 yes and 624 no. And then finally, the capital reserve fund passed, which was 2,316 yes votes, 675 no votes. And then Catherine Dean, Kristen Hawley, and Mark Elledge were elected to three-year terms commencing on July 1st, 2021 to June 30th, 2024. And there's no unfinished business. Is there any new business? All right, with that, uh, we have a, I have a motion that the meeting be adjourned at 8.32. So moved. Second. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Any opposed? Meeting adjourned.